With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Our recent student camp theme was unpopular. We talked for several days, morning, afternoon, and evening about what it meant to stand for the cause of righteousness. And in each of those lessons, I gave the following statement, that it is better to be alone in the cause of right than to be in a crowd in the cause of wrong. After developing that theme for several days, I also introduced our students to this simple statement. You'll not see it on the screen, but it's just a reminder that being better in the cause of right, we've said it's better to be alone in the cause of right, but merely being better in the cause of right does not necessarily mean that it will be more comfortable. In fact, when you are better in the cause of right, especially when you feel like you are alone in the cause of right, it will be, in fact, more uncomfortable. And the question before us this morning and now tonight, how is that discomfort, how is that suffering, how is that persecution a blessing? Webster's Dictionary says that persecution is hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race or political or religious beliefs. How is it a blessing to face that kind of ill treatment? I told you this morning that the Greek word that appears in verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12 means to make to run, to harass or trouble, to pursue in a hostile manner. So when someone is running after you, as it were, to chase you out of town, to run you off the job, to pursue you to a place of vulnerability, how exactly is that a blessing? I gave you a lengthy quote this morning from a persecuted brother in an African nation, and the main statement that I want to give you again tonight, he said that Christians trust deficit, that is, the deficit of trust, the lack of confidence, the failure to fully rest in and rely upon God. Christians' trust deficit can be attributed to a lack of knowledge of the ways of God. Daniel said it this way in his prophetic book, Daniel eleven thirty two: 32, the people who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. By contrast, the people who are ignorant of their God and of His ways tend to be weak and walk in perpetual defeat. There are three general truths that I want to lay before you today. We saw this morning the occasion of persecution, and we asked and answered the question, when does persecution occur? 2 Timothy 3.12, really a theme passage for this particular study, says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And I took some time to share with you this morning that persecution is when you face difficulty for doing right. Meanwhile, punishment is when you face difficulty for doing wrong. And I'm not going to take any time to review the morning message. You can find that online or get a recording of it. But I just simply gave you three instances, three occasions in which persecution will inevitably come. When we exhibit sanctification, that is when we walk and when we live and when we do right. Jesus says, you're blessed when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, if you're living an ungodly, unholy, unrighteous life, you cannot call that persecution. That's, uh, that's lessons you're learning at God's school of hard knocks. That's just the, the consequences of foolish and sometimes sinful actions. But persecution comes when we exhibit sanctification. It comes when we explain Scripture, when we open our mouth and tell a lost and dying world what God has declared in His Word. And persecution comes when we exalt the Savior. If you lift up the blood-stained banner of the cross of Jesus, this polytheistic, multicultural, believe anything and get to God kind of world will revile you and persecute you. That's the occasion of persecution. But tonight I want us to pick up there and answer a second question, deal with a second issue, and that is the operation of persecution. How does persecution come? We saw this morning when it comes, but how does it come? In what ways does persecution manifest itself in our lives? 
Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. That means we, we know how the devil operates. And in persecution, I have identified five different areas, five ways in which persecution comes. And just jot these simple phrases down first. You will be socially abused. That is in your social relationships, in the area of friendship and fellowship, you will endure persecution. For our children and our students, maybe even some of our adults, you may actually be bullied. You may fail to be invited to the party. One Monday morning, my a friend and I, we were in the band room where all of the band kids hung out before school, and we discovered that our other larger group of friends had had a party on Friday night, and we realized that we had not been invited to the party. That bothered us at the time. We quickly learned they did not invite us because there was going to be a lot of alcohol at that party, and they said, we knew the two of you would not feel comfortable. I realized, Brother Josh, they actually unwittingly paid us a very high compliment and kept us out of an awful lot of trouble. But it didn't feel good at the time. It felt like we were being left out, set to the side, indeed persecuted. You may not get invited to the lake house. Students, you may not get invited to the prom. But as I said to our student camp, there are some things worse than being left alone on a Friday night. And that is waking up Saturday morning with an awful lot of regret. As adults, we can be socially abused. You may be ridiculed for the education choices you've made for your family. You may find yourself the brunt of jokes if you have more than 2.2 children. I always feel sorry for that point two of a child. You may be scoffed at for dressing modestly. I actually heard this recently from one professing Christian to another asking, why do you always dress like a granny? I don't guess there's anything wrong with dressing like a granny if, if you're a granny. But these days, if you're just a woman who desires to dress in a way that is consistent with making a claim to godliness, the world will say that you are dressing like an elderly grandmother. How are we to respond when we are socially abused? Well, in Matthew 5, verse 44, you may see it there in your own Bible down in verse 44. Jesus said, but I say unto you, love your enemies Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them, look at this, which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know why Jesus warned you about people who would despitefully use you? Because some people in this world will despitefully use you. And you and I need to know how to respond to that. In John 16, 2, the master said, they will make you outcast from the synagogue. I'm talking about being unacceptable to polite, cultured society. I believe it is possible in the lifetime of our students and young adults. I predict that in the United States of America, there will be certain clubs and organizations you cannot join unless you sign away your convictions on the dotted line of application into membership of that club. I believe there will be schools you can't get into and jobs you won't be able to get. There are certain companies right now that you will not be able to work for them without completing their sensitivity training or their diversity training. And while we should be sensitive to others and we should certainly embrace the multifaceted beauty of God's creation of humanity, understand when the secular world says sensitivity... That means Bible-believing Christians, shut your mouth about your beliefs. And when depraved humanity speaks of diversity, let's be honest, that means embrace sexual abominations and perversions. And if you do not, polite society will attack and abuse you. At our student camp, I did an afternoon session each afternoon entitled, what every believer should know about social justice. And by the way, if you don't know it, social justice these days does not mean that you believe in a just society. 
for a major portion of that study was about the definition of terms. And I want to just give you an example of what it means to be socially abused. There was a day not that long ago that tolerance, for example, the word tolerance and the idea of being tolerant meant that if a same-sex couple, a man and a man, moved into your neighborhood, tolerance meant just a few years ago that you did not seek to verbally attack them, that you did not go picket in front of their house, that you did not make an appeal to the homeowners association to have them removed from the neighborhood. And by the way, I think all of those are actually good things. We should be kind and we should not verbally attack and we should not seek to demean and to put someone else down. But tolerance now means that if you do not celebrate their same-sex so-called marriage, and bring them a housewarming gift, we may end up actually picketing your house because we don't want right-wing intolerant bigots living in our neighborhood. And those days are quickly descending upon the United States of America. Child of God, are you ready and willing to receive the blessing of being socially abused? Persecution also operates in that you will be verbally attacked. With your Bible open to Matthew 5, look again at verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you. That's a word that speaks of demeaning or condescending speech and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil. One translation says, and speak all kinds of evil against you falsely. Now note again, this is not somebody who's being criticized for doing wrong. Jesus says the blessing only comes when those unkind reviling words are not true. When they utter these things against you falsely. Jesus said in verse 11 that you'll be blessed when people insult you and say unkind things about you, that's when it's behind your back, and against you, that's when it's to your face, or these days when it's on your Facebook, or Instagram, or Twitter account. Jesus said when they verbally attack you for righteousness sake, that is a blessing. Luke 8, 53 reminds us that the crowd that ultimately condemned the Lord Jesus, laughed at him. They mocked him and they scoffed him. Even as he hung on Calvary's cross, the two thieves began hurling insults at him, one of them eventually saved by the wonderful grace of God. But, but the Pharisees and all of the skeptics and scoffers, they continually hurled verbal attacks at the precious Lord Jesus Christ And if we live like he lived and say what he said, we should expect to be verbally attacked as well. It may be name-calling. It may be a whisper campaign against you. It may be that the gossip of the grapevine runs against you. Whoever it was that said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is a bald-faced lie. And these days, may I say again, social media is one of the primary places that these verbal attacks may occur. You'll be called a holy roller, bigoted, homophobic, intolerant, narrow-minded, mean-spirited, right-wing, alt-right, ultra-conservative, ultra-fundamentalist. Christian nationalist, and far, far worse. And when the attacks come, whether they come through a text message, through a Snapchat, through a comment on your Facebook feed, or somebody just blessing you out. Just remember here in the South, when somebody blesses you out for righteousness' sake, they actually did just bless you out. Because Jesus said, Blessed are you when for righteousness sake people revile you and utter all kinds of evil things against you falsely. How does persecution come? You may be socially abused, verbally attacked. You may be physically assaulted. During the days of the emperor Nero, Christians were literally fed to lions and other beasts. History tells us that 
believers would be dipped in wax and set on fire to provide horrific luminaries for the emperor's nighttime parties. Christians would be beheaded, burned at the stake, and face impalement and other types of horrific and horrible death. And writing to first century Christians who needed to know how to endure this kind of persecution and hardship, Simon Peter writes his first letter, 1 Peter 3, 14, and says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, here's our word again, you are blessed. Blessed to be smitten in the face. Blessed to be beaten. Blessed to be flogged. Blessed to even be killed. Jesus said, We're blessed when we are persecuted. Now, you say, I don't think that we would face physical assault in the United States of America. Well, I did not come tonight to be political, but I do want to give you, just by way of teaching and illustration, an illustration from the world of recent American politics. Last summer, when racially motivated protests burned this country down from sea to shining sea, leading voices among the Christian community, some of them even Southern Baptist, suggested that we should lament and listen and learn as to why these violent anarchists were burning down our country. Now, in light of that, I want to make two very brief observations. Observation number one, I'm always willing to listen and to learn, but I don't need to stop and listen to learn why depraved people act like depraved people. They act the way they act because they are what they are. And as we noted this morning, men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. I know why depraved people act the way they do. It's because their hearts have been darkened by sin. The second observation that I will make, and you need to lean in close and listen very carefully. If a person's feelings and perceived personal experiences, that is somebody may have a right to burn down a police station because of a perceived injustice committed against them. If a person's feelings, emotions, and perceived personal experiences are seen as justification for violence and anarchy, it will not be long before some of the woke Christians subtly justifying these actions find themselves on the receiving end of similar acts of violence and anarchy. You and I do not personally want to live in a country where I can treat you any way I want to if I perceive that somebody has mistreated me. Therefore, I think I have a right to mistreat you. In John 16, 2, the master said that an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he is offering service to God. Now, certainly that was largely fulfilled in the late first century and in the early centuries of Christendom. But as far-fetched as it may sound, the idea that it would still occur today Let me once again bring a couple of observations to bear. First, you need to consider the well-known statement that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. If you're not familiar with church history, you need to get that statement in your mind. It is a true statement that throughout church history, the blood of the martyrs has been the seed of the church. And that statement did not become popular because there haven't been a lot of martyrs down through church history. The second observation I would make is that more Christians were killed for their faith in the 20th century around the world than in the previous 19 centuries combined. In many places around the world as we sit here tonight, in some places it's already tomorrow, And our brothers and sisters in the faith face physical assault, perhaps even death. Those days could come once again to the United States of America. And I ask, are you ready to receive that kind of blessing? Operation of persecution number four, you could be legally accused. 
And I do believe that we are already in these days, perhaps the early days, but very much in these days in the United States of America. To face accusation even on the judicial or the legal front. Being at student camp just a few weeks ago, I was reminded of being at student camp myself some (laughs) years ago. And uh, I was in the student group in what many of you my age will remember as the height of the Cold War. Uh, There was a lot of tension between the United States and the former Soviet Union, between the United States and Russia. And one night our guest speaker came in to preach at student camp, and he scared us to death with the idea that at any moment... A Russian KGB officer having taken control of the United States of America could come into our student camp with a big assault rifle and demand that we renounce our faith or be killed. And all my classmates and students from our denominational churches all around South Georgia and North Florida, they go flooding to the altar to profess that they're willing to be shot dead for the sake of the gospel. And I'm thinking, you don't even come back to church on Sunday night for the sake of the gospel. You think you're going to be willing to die for Jesus? Paul and Silas sang in jail at the midnight hour. You won't even sing in the student choir. You won't even sing on Sunday morning when everybody around you is clapping and singing. You think you're going to sing in jail when you get arrested for the sake of the gospel? But throughout church history, many have been legally accused. Jesus promised that that would happen in Luke 12, 21, 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. It was this past Thursday or Friday, I was on the telephone with a career Baptist missionary who used to serve in what we would call a closed part of the world. That is, he had served for many years in a part of the world where it's, uh, you know, you, you could suffer death threats just to be known as a missionary. And missionaries go into countries like that uh, claiming other occupations. They go doing other things, so they have a platform to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And in that country which he did not name, he said that one qualification to be a pastor, if you were going to be a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching pastor in one of the underground illegal congregations in that closed country, one qualification is you had to have been arrested. They deemed that since Christianity was illegal, If you've lived openly and boldly and confidently enough for the Lord, enough to be our pastor, we want to see your arrest record. In the United States, when a pulpit is vacated, the search committee, the pulpit committee, might ask to see your resume and a letter of recommendation. In that country, they ask for your resume and a good copy of your last mugshot. I recently heard the story told as a true story from the underground church of China. A congregation was gathering to meet, and just as the service began, a man stood up and produced what seemed to be some type of identification that he was from, that he was from the, the Red Army, that he was a, an official with the Chinese government there to arrest anybody that stayed in that service. He reportedly said that anybody that wanted to leave could leave now, but anybody that stayed would be arrested. And many got up and hit the doors and fled for their life and freedom, at which point the story says he announced to the pastor that that was all just a charade, but with all of this legal danger that they were facing, he didn't want to take a chance. He put that fake ID back in his pocket and said, preach on, pastor. You and I could indeed face legal accusation. There's another way in which persecution operates. That is, we could be financially affected. It could hit you in the pocketbook. I recently read an article about a company that employed two homosexual men, and the men got married 
And the, and the boss required everyone in the office to sign a greeting card to congratulate them. And uh, the article in which I read this was sort of a Christian version of Dear Abby where this Christian employee wrote seeking some advice, what do I do? I cannot sign this congratulations card. It would be violating Christian conviction. It would be violating my conscience. And those are just, uh, that's just a small example of how we can be affected even with our employment. I've already indicated there are companies today that you will not be able to get a job at if you do not sign up and sign on for ungodly principles. Now, I need to move on, but let me just say that between the leftward move of the secular courts and the cancel culture of mainstream media and the social media, the coming persecution against believers may hit you in the wallet long before it hits you in the jaw. The operation of persecution. But our question today, how is persecution a blessing? And for that, we turn to our third and final point, which I've labeled the outcome of persecution. This really begins to get down to the essence of how persecution is a good thing. Jesus does not tell us in the Sermon on the Mount exactly how it's going to be a good thing. He just tells us in verse 10, we're blessed. Tells us in verse 11, we're blessed. Tells us in verse 12, rejoice and be glad, which is another way of saying you should be blessed. And yet we find indication in other places in the Bible of how persecution can indeed will be a blessing. And I I just want to give you three of them as we wrap things up this evening. First of all, God's help will be a resource. You will discover the strength of Almighty God moving on your behalf. I can't help but think about Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Good Bible students will remember that Paul had this unknown unnamed thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was or perhaps it was a person. We don't know who it was. We do know that Paul had this thorn in the flesh, and three different times he asked God to remove it. And God said, no, I'm not going to remove it, but I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to give you grace that will be sufficient for your need. And you will discover in that moment that my strength is perfected in your weakness. You'll find out how strong I am when you realize how weak you are. Is there anybody else in the building tonight that often tries to handle their problems on their own? And we never fully understand the wonderful help that our God can be to us, the resource that His strength and power can be until we are brought to the end of ourselves, to where we cannot help ourselves. We can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We can't turn our situation over. We cannot do anything for ourselves, and it puts us flat on our face in the presence of God to say, Lord, if this situation is going to change, you're the one that's going to have to do it. And that is a blessing. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, again, 1 Peter is written to Christians in persecution. Simon writes, Therefore those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. You see, when we suffer persecution... Again, for righteousness' sake. When we deal with it rightly according to the will of God, one of the blessings is when we walk through that, we realize we have a God who is a faithful creator who will strengthen us and help us and assist us and enable and empower us to walk through that time of difficulty. As I contemplated how I would illustrate this truth to you this afternoon, I thought about my own earthly father. Brothers and sisters, do you know why I trust my dad? It's because my dad is a man of character and integrity. He has never let me down. He has never done me anything but good. Now, that may not be your testimony about your earthly father, but if you're a child of God, that can be your testimony about your heavenly father. Speaking of my earthly dad, I can look back and think of times that I did not understand why he was allowing certain things into my life. 
But I did not know then what I know now, and that is he was allowing these things to be worked out for my good. When I was six years old, many of you know this part of my testimony. One week after my sixth birthday, I received third-degree burns over a large portion of my upper body. My upper torso has been the subject of many, many surgeries, plastic surgery and reconstruction. And I remember that I did not understand why my dad that night, that first night in the emergency room at the South Georgia Medical Center, I did not know why my dad was helping hold me down for them to pour this stuff over my stomach that was burning me, that was hurting me, and in my immaturity, and frankly, in my ignorance, I did not understand why my dad, who I thought loved me, who I thought I could trust, hey, who I thought had my back, why was my dad allowing them to hurt me so? And after that first very painful skin graft surgery, pain like I'd never experienced in my life, and I don't know that I've experienced that kind of pain since, I remember as a six-year-old boy begging my daddy, screaming and begging my daddy not to let them put me to sleep again, to take me back in for another kind of surgery like the one that I just had. And my dad, as best I could tell, seemed indifferent to my request. He seemed deaf to my pleas. But now that I know my father better, and now that I'm a father myself, I know that my dad was being the best friend that I could have ever had. And may I testify to you tonight, there have been times in my life as a believer that I have not understood why God has allowed certain things to come into my life. But as I've come to grow in the Lord, as I've come to walk with the Lord, as I've come to know him better and trust him more fully, I can tell you now that I know why the old gospel songwriter called him the dearest friend that I've ever had. We sang it a few moments moments ago, I'm so glad that I learned to trust. You don't come in the world pre-wired to trust him like that, but I'm so glad that at the school of hard knocks, I have learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And now I know that he is with me and will be with me to the end. And when persecution brings you to a place and hardship in this life for the cause of Christ knocks you in the jaw and lays you out flat of your back, you'll look up and to the face of God and you'll say like this verse on the screen says, I've got a faithful creator. God is my strength. God is my help. God is my refuge. And that dear child of God is a blessing to have that kind of perspective. So so we're we're finally getting to the point and answering the question, how is persecution a blessing? It's because only in difficulty can we really ultimately find God's help will be a resource. There's a second blessing, and this one isn't nearly as happy clappy. God's holiness will be a result. For you see, fiery trials, even those trials of persecution have a way of bringing our sin to the surface. They they have a way of revealing that we're not as close and clean as we maybe thought that we were. These fiery trials have a way of sanctifying us and making us more like the Lord. No wonder the early apostles in Acts chapter 4 and 5 left the flogging post and went on their way rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi and said that the opportunity to suffer for the sake of Christ was a gift that had been granted by God. How could this be a granted gift from the Lord? Well, once again from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Simon says, keep a clean conscience. Talking about living right and doing right. Keep a clean conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior will be put to shame, for it is better. Talking about how persecution is a blessing, it is better if God should will it so for you to suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. It's in the crucible of adversity, indeed, the fiery trial of persecution, that God will put his holy finger 
on undeveloped, immature, disobedient areas of our life. I don't want to overly illustrate this message tonight with my own life, but two weeks ago tonight, the Sunday night of our student camp, I left here really following our students to the campus of Bruton Parker College. I was in my own vehicle by myself, about an hour or so behind the students. And I took that opportunity to make a late Sunday night phone call to a trusted pastor friend. He knew that I've experienced some difficulty in the last month or so in my life, and he was inquiring as to how I was doing, especially in the face of what I will just simply say false accusations. And, and I shared with him in my frustration, I, I named one of my most prominent critics, and I said to this trusted friend, you know what I wish for him? I wish somebody in his life would falsely accuse him of something like this and let him see how it feels. And I'm telling you, the power of Almighty God grabbed me by the nap of the neck, and I began to cry out in repentance on that phone call. God, forgive me for feeling that way. And I began to pray for my accuser. And I began to intercede that God would never allow anything like that to happen in his life. And I began to confess my sin to the Lord. God, forgive me that that came out of my mouth. And I know enough about the Bible to know that it came out of my mouth because it was down in my heart. And the fiery trial of persecution began to do a sanctifying work in my life. This is what the hymn writer meant when he so beautifully wrote, you know that old song, how firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Another verse says, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, God says, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply and the flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. And when the difficulties of this life bring you face to face with the ugliness of your own sin, and you cry out to God in humble, broken repentance, and you experience the cleansing power of God, you'll cry out along with David in Psalm 32, how blessed is the man whose transgressions have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. You'll say, even that persecution turned into a blessing from God. It's in persecution you discover God's help will be a resource, God's holiness will be a result. And finally, God's heaven will be a reward. In our main text tonight, in Matthew 5 and verse 12, the Master says, Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward. Mm. I wish it said on earth. Great is your reward in where? In heaven. Then he adds this, For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. By the way, this is one of the best ways to get in the same line with Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Obadiah and all the other ayahs of the Bible. You say, boy, I want to be like those great men of old. Well, one way you can be like them is to live and do what's right and suffer persecution, and you'll walk right in line with all the faithful prophets through the ages. Beloved, the primary reason we don't see persecution as a blessing is we don't have a long-term view. We're looking for the immediate return. I shared with our students that when I get my pay stub, I have to remind myself that all the gross amount, most of that's still mine, except for the taxes and some guy named FICA who keeps taking a bunch of my money. But one of the lines that I've had to mature my way into happiness about is that line where they take out from my retirement. 
And I'm doing my best to plan well for retirement, so it's a significant percentage of my income. And I look at that, and all I can think about is what I'd love to be doing with that money now. But if you have a short-term view, you're going to eat all your seed, and then when harvest time comes, you're not going to have any food. That's great financial advice. I just dropped that in this sermon for free tonight. But the reason watching that retirement deduction doesn't make me upset I've got the future in mind. And in order to understand this aspect of the blessedness of persecution, you and I have to have a longer-term view. We've got to think for just a moment about what will happen one day in the presence of God. Paul had this, no doubt, on his mind in Romans 8 after discussing the wonderful plan of God to redeem us through Christ. In Romans 8, 35, he begins asking rhetorically, what will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And he goes on to say, no, in all of these things we are more than conquerors, for nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How is persecution a blessing? Well, there are blessings we will receive in this life. It's the blessed hope of being able to rest in the power and presence and comfort of God. I believe there will be millennial blessings from living a life that is more purified, more sanctified, more pleasing to the Lord, therefore resulting in a greater reward and greater standing in His kingdom. But the ultimate and greatest blessing is the eternal reward in heaven of hearing our master teacher say, well done, good and faithful servant. This morning I close with a passage from 1 Peter 2.20 that says in part that when we do what is right and suffer for it with patient endurance, this finds favor with God. And for the child of God living for the favor of God, for the child of God living for the favor of God, For the child of God living for the favor of God, there's no greater blessing than that one. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.